concussion is a mild traumatic injury to the brain caused by a direct blow to the head, face or neck, but also an impact elsewhere on the body can cause a concussion if it causes a force to be transmitted to the head. For example, a rugby tackle to the chest could cause the body and head to decelerate quickly, but the brain will continue to move forwards and potentially make impact with the front and then the back of the skull in a whiplash type of movement. There are several common features that define the nature of a concussive head injury. Firstly, concussion typically results in the rapid onset of short-lived impairment of neurological function at the time of injury. So in English, that means they might feel a bit unsteady, they might have blurred vision, etc., amongst other things. This often resolves spontaneously. However, in some cases, symptoms and signs can only become apparent minutes to hours after the trauma has occurred. Secondly, acute concussion doesn't cause structural damage to the brain. The impact adversely affects brain function, which causes symptoms. Persistent trauma may, however, cause structural neuropathology later on in life, and we'll talk about that later in the series. And thirdly, concussion doesn't have to involve the loss of consciousness. Resolution of clinical and cognitive symptoms typically follows a sequential linear course, which means it usually improves like this. However, it's important to note in some cases symptoms can be prolonged and require a flexible approach to treatment and also that eventual return to sport. But before we go any further, let's take a little step back because if it's an injury to the brain, we should first talk very briefly about how the brain works. The brain's made up of many, many millions of neurons that carry messages to and from the brain, controlling every function in our body. Some are messages of which we're consciously aware, so for example, uh, when we want to move our body, but the vast majority happen automatically without our conscious control, things like controlling our heartbeat. Thoughts, emotions, breathing, hormone regulation, balance, coordination are just a few examples of what the brain controls. Therefore, if the brain controls everything, if it's injured or damaged, it has the potential to affect anything in our body and what our mind does on a daily basis. As well as concussive blows to the head, we have subconcussive impacts too. Subconcussive hits are those that are below the concussion threshold. The brain is shaken, but not so violently that the damage is severe enough to cause symptoms. Research has suggested that after 1800 subconcussive blows to the head, a person will start to show symptoms or signs of brain injury. Now, 1800 sounds a lot, doesn't it? Agreed. To most of us, yes, but when you look at certain sports, the numbers aren't quite so encouraging. Looking at soccer, for example, in League Two, which is the fourth tier of professional soccer in England, there were 20,582 headers recorded by Opta over 140 games. Now, that's 147 headers on average per game, Divide that by 20, because we're not expecting the goalkeepers to be heading the ball very much. It is good! Oh, it's incredible! Absolutely remarkable! And we get seven headers per match per player. If we crudely extrapolate that over a 45-game season, allowing for a few cup games here and there, we've got potential of 315 sub-concussive blows to the head over the whole season. If they have a six-year career, that takes them to 1,890 subconcussive blows to the head. The lower the level of soccer, the more headers take place. And this is certainly the case for the professional game in England. Therefore, we can only assume that this trend continues into the amateur levels of the game. Perhaps some players reach their 1,800 after only four years. And remember, this is only taking matches into consideration. We've not even added training load into the equation. Or the fact that these players have been heading the ball since they were maybe eight or nine years old. It's a concern, and that's why the English FA have followed the example of the United States Soccer Federation and decided to ban headers for children under the age of 12. It's an attempt to reduce this cumulative load in a key development stage of life. In American football, a collegiate level player is estimated to experience approximately 1,000 subconcussive blows per season. If you're on a four year scholarship, and then maybe you even progress to the NFL where the hits are even harder. Now, if we were to trust these numbers, 
the chances of suffering life-changing brain damage are quite high. And this is concerning enough. However, if we switch gears a bit, just as concerning is the research findings that one out of three sports-related concussions go unreported, and it's more likely an athlete will hide a concussion than report one. It's thought that due to the lack of understanding of what a concussion is, so what are the signs and the symptoms, because they can be so vague in a lot of cases, this contributes to why so many concussions go unrecognised by players, coaching staff, medical staff and parents, which means the concussion goes completely unreported. There's a cultural issue in sport as well, where we're encouraged to sort of tough it out and get on with it. Or we often assume that children, oh, they'll be, they'll be fine. And this is an example of a decision made from ignorance. To fix any problem, you first need to be aware that the problem's there in the first place. And this is easy when someone sprains an ankle, cuts their knee, tears their ACL or their rotator cuff, because we can see the injury. But what about those injuries we can't see? Brain injuries. So how do we build awareness? Well, first we need to educate. We replace myth with fact and we replace confusion with clarity and we give people the skills and processes needed to identify this invisible injury. So let's imagine we're watching a game of football, rugby, basketball, netball, etc. How do we know if a potential concussion has occurred? What is it we're looking out for? Yes, a direct blow to the head, face, neck or other body part that has potentially transmitted force to the head. Symptoms experienced following a concussion can vary greatly, as we said before, and can be very difficult to pick up for an experienced healthcare practitioner. So what chance have members of the public got? Therefore, it helps to have a document handy to walk you through the process. For licensed healthcare professionals, the SCAP5 assessment, which we've put a link to in the show notes, that stands for the Sports Concussion Assessment Tool. It gives you 22 potential symptoms on a 0-6 to scoring scale, whether they're present or how severe they are. 0 means that the symptom isn't present and 6 means that the symptom is very severe. After this information has been collected, we can calculate a symptom score, so that would be the sum of the total number of reported symptoms. And also a symptom severity score, so the sum of the reported severity of each symptom. Ideally, this data can also be compared to pre-injury level, so you should do some testing pre-season as well. But once completed, you add up the scores collected for each of the 22 symptoms, and this provides objective data that can be used to track whether the athlete is recovering. We'll put a video link into the show notes that will take you through the different sections of the SCAT5 assessment form. And if you're watching on YouTube, there'll be a link in the corner somewhere. However, this is fine for levels of the game that have trained medical staff on site. But what about amateur levels of the game? What about youth levels of the game? How many youth matches have trained professional medical staff present? This is the case for the majority of games played every weekend. So we need to make sure we help there as well, not just at the elite level. FIFA have developed the Concussion Recognition Tool 5, the CRT5. And also we put a link to this in the show notes in the description as well. But print it off and we'll go through it together in this next part of the show. So pause now if you need to go and do that and print it off. A few minutes later. Okay, so you're back. You're ready. So firstly, they're assuming that everyone has excellent vision because it's in font size 8 in places, I'm sure. So remember, if you're going to use this form, keep your specs with you. (laughs) The first thing is to recognize that an impact causing a potential concussion has occurred. So if you're watching the game and you see that, if there's any concern after an impact, then we look to remove the player from the field of play for further assessment. If there's no healthcare professional present and the player is experiencing any of these, if they're experiencing neck pain or tenderness in the neck, double vision, weakness or tingling in the arms or legs, Severe or increasing headache, seizure or convulsion, loss of consciousness, deteriorating conscious state, vomiting, increasing restlessness, feeling agitated or combative, then call an ambulance. 
Although rare, head impacts can cause catastrophic head injuries and it's best to play it safe if any of those red flags are present. But all first aid principles still apply. We make sure the airways are clear and if there's any possibility of spinal cord injury, do not move the player. Have someone support the neck in their current position and leave all sort of crash helmets and equipment on them and wait for medical assistance to arrive. But if none of those previously mentioned red flags are present, we move on to step two of the assessment form. Are there any observable signs? Now a sign is something that you can see. So can you see any of these that makes you suspicious of a concussion? Are they laying motionless on the playing surface? Were they slow to get up after an impact directly or indirectly to the head? Is there any disorientation or confusion? Can they respond to your questions? Do they have a blank or vacant look? Are they stumbling or have any lack of coordination? Is there any obvious facial or head injury present? So any cuts or any swellings? But step three, we're gonna be looking for symptoms. Now, does the player mention any of these listed or admit to feeling any of them when questioned? I don't need to list them all out here because there's quite a few of them. They're written on the form here that you can see. But read those out to the player and remember to do all of this assessment well away from the match and any other distractions so they're not looking over your shoulder to see what's happening all the time. But finally in step four is a brief memory test. Now don't give them any clues or any help of course and only use this if they're over 12 years old. If they're under, it's not valid. Ask them where the game is being played today, which half is the game in, which team scored last in this game, what team did you play last week? And did your team win their last game? After this assessment, the player is either cleared or not. If you're unsure, then go on the side of caution and assume a concussion is there until proven otherwise by a medical professional. If concussion is suspected, then the player is obviously removed from training or play and instruction should be given to the coaching staff and a responsible adult for the player to not be left alone for at least the first two hours after the trauma. They shouldn't have any alcohol, no prescription or recreational drugs, and they're not to be sent home alone. And certainly no driving unless cleared by a trained medical professional. And also get the player booked in with a medical professional as well, preferably one that deals with concussion on a regular basis. I've heard some pretty disappointing stories lately of people who have been concussed and receive very substandard or sketchy assessment or advice. So now we understand more about what a concussion is, how it can be caused, and how we can recognize and record it using an easy to follow resource. For medical professionals, it's the SCAT-5, and for non-medically trained people, it's the Concussion Recognition Tool 5, the CRT-5. In the next episode, we're gonna talk about treatment strategies, and perhaps we'll get time to discuss a little bit about return to play strategies as well. So we'll see you in the next episode. Bye now.